Ephesians, the third chapter. To me, the least of all the saints, this grace was given. The grace to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to the Gentiles and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was the eternal purpose. The eternal purpose that God revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have the boldness and the confidence to access Him through faith. So I ask you, do not lose heart over what I suffer for you, because this is all for the glory of God. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you strength with power through His Holy Spirit in your inmost being, so that Christ can dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may comprehend with all the saints what is the length and the breadth and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge so you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. So today's sermon is about you are chosen. There was a joke about a pastor who got on a Chicago bus and unfortunately the bus, was kind of, bus driver was a little reckless and there was an, an accident and um, the bus driver and the pastor died. And so they went to heaven together and they get to the pearly gates And St. Peter said, welcome. And he could see a long line of people that made a parade, cheering, excited he was there. And the pastor sort of stood up straight and he said, wow, is this all for me? And he said, "Uh, no, we're glad you're here, but this is for the bus driver. He said, the bus driver, I've given my whole life to the church. I've preached every single Sunday. He said, well, when you preached, most people fell asleep. But when the bus driver drove, people prayed really hard. We are chosen to be a blessing and to be blessed. We are chosen to be united and to unite other people. We are chosen to be saved and to help save. And so in our bulletins, I made a little... We had some people in church who said they've been taking notes. So we made a little um, acronym, one, two, three. We are on a bus, blessed, united, and saved. Without God, that bus is just us. Without our unity in Christ, it's just BS. And without eternal salvation, it's just a scary story. Boo. And if you look at all the movies and books coming out about dystopias and apocalypse, Ron could tell us what's new in the libraries. And almost all of this deals with the end of the world as we know it. And it's all pretty scary without God. So first, we are called to be blessed in Christ. But that first means we have to get in Christ. We have to get on the bus. It doesn't matter if we have a ticket to ride if we never get on the bus or if we never make it on time for the bus. I'm going to use that joke for a long time. I don't think I've ever been late for church in my life, so it's funny. Once you get on the bus, you can go farther and you can go faster together. And you can do less work. My brother, who's about to retire from the Navy, used to say, hard work never killed anybody. But why take the chance? (laughs) I like to do things easy. I like to have someone else driving. We are blessed in Christ that this bus can go very far too. The scripture today told us four things. I spell it PFAR. Four things were in the Bible, so I just listed what's in the Bible. We are chosen to be perfection, chosen before the foundation of the world, chosen for adoption, and chosen for redemption. How many of you are already perfect? None of us, right? But the Bible clearly said today, and unless we're going to call the Bible mistaken in some way, it says we are called to perfection in Him, to be holy and blameless. Kids, in the back, have you ever had your parents blame you for anything? Yeah. 
The Bible says that you're blameless, that there's no way they could blame you. You've you got to teach kids to use the Bible every day. <laughs> but mom, the pastor said, I'm blameless, I'm innocent. He said we were chosen before the foundation of the world. Before anything that we see was laid out, God made one first move. He said, I want you. He said, I chose you to be with me. Individually ordered. He said, then we are chosen for adoption. We're not just chosen to be in a club. We're not chosen to be workers in the field. We are chosen to be sons and daughters in Christ. To be in the family of God. And finally, we're chosen for redemption. The scripture today said, it is through Jesus' blood... That we receive forgiveness of our trespasses by the riches. Think of a a big bank account. Or if you watch Harry Potter, when he first went to his Gringotts, Gringotts vault and he saw all the gold his parents had left him. We are blessed. I lost my place in the scripture. Usually I just make stuff up, but when you're quoting the scripture, I need to find my place. The forgiveness of our trespasses by the riches of his grace that he lavishes on us. He has got so much grace for us, so much forgiveness, so much love, but it comes with a price. I don't know if you read the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, or saw the movie, but Aslan had to give his life to redeem the young man who committed treason. There's a pastor in town I like, uh, Pastor uh, Ron's pastor, um, Dr. Um, Adam Weber, and he sends this devotion, been sending a devotion on the book of Mark. And at the end of Mark, he wrote this. He said, this is the foundation of our faith. You would not be reading the Bible if this story of Jesus' resurrection didn't take place. You wouldn't have ever attended church. It wouldn't be 2018. 2018 years after the birth and death and resurrection of Jesus. The Bible wouldn't be the best-selling book of all time. And more than anything, you wouldn't have heard. You wouldn't have been able to trust in the name of Jesus. And all of that hinges on the sacrifice that came in Jesus' blood and His death and His resurrection. It's messy. It's uncomfortable. We don't really talk about it. It's not really the thing that we use nowadays. But none of our lives would be the same if Jesus had not literally shed His blood. We are blessed, the Bible said today, with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. This um, salvation means it's not just about heaven. David sang in one of his psalms, I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The blessings we have are spiritual blessings in heavenly places, but they are for now. There was a young man named David Asselbrook about 40, 50 years ago who died in an accident and had a vision of heaven. And he came back to life. And he told this story that He saw these angels going to what looked to him like a large warehouse. And he asked what it was. And they said, this warehouse is full of individual blessings for all the people of the world. And he said, well, why is it so full? He said, well, people often won't accept the blessings that God has for them. God has all of these blessings stored up for us. And Jesus often said that the point of our life on this earth is to store up more blessings or treasures for our retirement in the future. I don't understand that. It seems awfully nitty-gritty, awfully practical, awfully earthly. But I have a feeling that God who created all things made the shadow of things on earth to be a predictor of the things we're going to experience in heaven. So we have, you have, warehouses of blessings stored up in spiritual places that you can ask for and receive at any time. But I think it's a little bit like a UPS guy. I mean, if you're not going to answer the door... You know, he can't leave the package. They leave that little postal note, the, uh, the postal service. You have to go to the office and pick it up. So we have to be willing to receive God's blessing. What are the blessings besides salvation? Healing, peace, joy, provision, forgiveness, strength, power, wisdom, faith, hope, love, self-control. You have read the Bible. All the things in the Bible, thousands and thousands of promises are yours. And we are blessed, the Bible said today, to bless God. It said, may the God of our fa- and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ be blessed. Now, who here would think that God would need to ble- be blessed? Or certainly could be blessed by us. But God made us to love us. And He made us so that He could receive praise for how gloriously graceful he, gracious He has been for us. On the bus, there's blessed and there's united. How many of you feel united? I feel pretty united with you guys. 
Um, my, my church that I pastor, Hampshire Colony, will not let me use chainsaws. So um, I saw the tree was down on the sidewalk there, and I thought, you know what? I'm a grown man. I went to Ace Hardware, and I bought my own chainsaw. And they ex- two different people explained to me how to operate it. And then I came out here to cut it down and couldn't start the chainsaw. So I went back to Ace Hardware, and uh, they started it for me. And uh, then I came back. And then I cut that tree down with uh, supervision from Dennis, the guy who owns Taylor Trees. So, um, yeah, I'm feeling pretty confident that I was able to cut. I didn't ask anybody's permission here because I was afraid you'd tell me I couldn't use a chainsaw like my church won't. But God blessed us because he has work for us to do, but also because we are united together. The scripture today said, In all wisdom and insight... He makes known to us the mystery of His will, according to His own purposes, which He set forth in Christ. That's a pretty high standard, right? Wisdom, insight, God's purpose, God's will in Christ. Because this was the plan for the whole fullness of time. At that point, you're on the edge of your seat. It's like, God, what are you up to? And He says the plan was to unite us all in Him. All things in heaven and on earth. Every one of us wants to go to heaven. We want to live forever and have this glorious, unimaginably great life. But did you realize that this verse indicates that heaven also wants to come to earth? I guess the grass is... Who was the lady, Irma Bombeck? She used to say the grass is always greener on the other side of the septic tank. Heaven wants to come here. We want to go there. And Jesus says, I'm going to bring it all together. And my whole plan is to unite everything in creation, heaven and earth, as one. We are united, we are chosen to be blessed, we are chosen to be united, and we are chosen to be saved. The scripture today said, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, this gospel that is saving you, not saved you, not like I have a ticket, I'm already in heaven, it's a ticket I can get on the bus and it's a process. This gospel that is saving you, as you believed in him, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit that guarantees our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. And this will bring praise to the glory of God. Unfortunately, inheritance comes with a small condition, which is you got to die. Somebody's got to die. We're all dying. None of us can save ourselves. There's, it's a horrible joke. I probably shouldn't tell this, but once I say that, it's usually a sign I'm going to tell it. The doctor said, I'm, I'm really, I really don't like to share this with you, but you only have uh, five to live. And they said, five? Five months? Five weeks? Five days? He said, four Three. (laughs) So sorry. We are dead people. We are living a life that will end. And the only hope we have is in God. Jesus said, Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. And indeed, the water I give will become a spring of water welling up to their eternal life. I don't know if you're familiar with the Festival of Booths. I think this year it's September 23rd. It's usually in October. But the Jewish people, one of their big three festivals, a week-long festival, is they make these tents out of these four different uh, plants. They have the uh, citron, palm, myrtle, and willow. Basically, a plant that has a fruit and a smell, a fruit and no smell, a smell and no fruit, and no fruit or smell whatsoever. And that celebration is the festival to show that we rely on God. And God's word, his revelation to us. And what they do is they not only make those tents, but they wave those four different branches together. And it signifies us, that we are all totally dependent on God. Those of us who have fruit, who do good things, and have a beautiful smell. We know the law, we know the faith, we know the word of God. But then there are some people that produce fruit and they don't know anything. They just do good things. Then there are some people who know what time church is supposed to start, and they still can't show up and produce any fruit. And there's some of us people that don't do anything right and we don't know anything. And this celebration says all of us need God and depend on God because none of us, even the best and certainly not the worst, are great enough to live forever. During this festival, each day with music and dance, they have a parade lying the streets of the Jerusalem Pilgrim Road. During this simchat, this celebration, the priest will go with a golden vessel that's three logs of measurement, like liters, and fill up the water in the pool of Siloam and walk all the way up to the temple. The joy is palpable. The Jewish Mishnah says, He who does not see the rejoicing of the place of the drawing of water has never seen rejoicing in their life. And then afterwards, every night, tens of thousands of people gather 
The best of the best are chosen in the community. The best scholars, the most holy people, the ones who have done so many good works during the year. And they're chosen to dance. And they have harps and lyres and cymbals and trumpets. And they sing praises and songs and they dance before the Lord as this incredible throng would watch them. And the water arrives at the temple and a chauffeur is blown. And all eyes watch the priest take that golden jug to the behind the altar. And there's two holes in the altar, or there were before the temple was destroyed. One hole was a big hole where the wine was poured at every single sacrifice of blood. And the other hole that was only used during this one celebration is a lot smaller. And it's where the water was poured during this daily celebration during the week of the Festival of Booths. And it was different sizes so that the, the thickness of the water and the wine would pour and swirl down at exactly the same time through the altar. It's based on an oral tradition from Moses in Isaiah's scripture that says, with joy you will draw out water from the wells of salvation. And it's at the last day of this festival that Jesus Christ stood up and it said, Jesus stood and cried out in a loud voice saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He stood and shouted. Though the rabbinical tradition was to sit quietly and to teach. He stood and shouted because the sand in the hourglass was down to its grains. In six months, on those same streets, he would be dragging his body and across to Golgotha. And the people were thirsty now. They needed water, but not for their throats, for their hearts. And so he invited them to drink me. Jesus, well, is that water at work in us. Jesus' work, Jesus' energy, Jesus' lordship, and Jesus' love. Dip in to that well. Where can you find water for your soul? Jesus has come to bless you, to unite us, and to save us all if we will internalize Him, if we will imbibe Him, if we will drink Him in and ingest Him and welcome Him in to the innermost workings of our heart. Would you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, so this is a sermon titled, You Are Chosen, off of the scripture today in Ephesians. And this is part two. We did a part one at the Presbyterian Church when I finally managed to make it there to the service a little late. Um, I was thinking of a joke. The uh, church council was meeting, and uh, they told the pastor, we're sorry, pastor, we're not able to give you a raise this year. And he said, well, well why not? I mean, you've got, you got to give me a raise. I'm just a, a poor preacher. And they said, we know. We listen to you every Sunday. <laughs> I was talking to the Presbyterian sisters and brothers that uh, we are on the, we're chosen to be on the bus. We're chosen to be blessed. Chosen to be united, chosen to be saved. And we are. We're chosen to be blessed and united and saved. It's the same sermon here, but a slightly different focus. Because we are blessed to be a blessing to others. Paul said today in the reading that Mary Lou shared with us, that he felt blessed by God's grace to be given a job. Today we were praying for one of our brothers that he would find a job. It's a blessing to have work. It's a blessing to have an opportunity to employ you know, I must have had this scripture on my mind because I was thinking all week how thankful I, were, I was for our, um, our companies and our businesses around town. We have a lot of great employment opportunities around town. Factories and warehouses and restaurants and offices and stores and all kinds of things for, for young men and women, for people of all ages to stay here and to work. I feel blessed to be called pastor whether you give me a raise or not, you know. Like Paul, I think we all feel that we're blessed because we're part of this great... It's an impossible task, right? To preach Christ's unsearchable riches to the Gentiles, that's us. To bring light for everyone. The mystery of the plan that was hidden for ages by God who created all things. I mean, this is, this is an incredibly difficult task. Paul can't do it. All of us can't do it. But maybe all of us together with God's power can do this easy job. We are also blessed by not only being on the bus, so to speak, to go to heaven or in Christ, or to have a job to do, but we're blessed because Jesus is the one that's inside us actually doing all of this work. How many of you know that to be true in your life? We've, 
we've done something, we've faced a challenge, we've faced a difficulty, and we feel that God is just moving things, heaven and earth, to get things exactly in the right place, exactly the right time where we need it. The Bible said today that Jesus is able to do, quote, far more than we can ask. I don't know about you, but I can ask a whole lot. He said, God is able to do far more than we can even think or imagine. And I can imagine a whole lot according to his power. Where? At work inside of us. We don't have to go to the temple. We don't have to go to the altar. We don't have to go to a priest. We don't have to go to anywhere anymore. We don't even have to go to the throne of God because the throne of God said he was going to be seated and make his home inside of us. He loves us that much. And he gives us that power. What power is that? Well, the Bible said today he gives us boldness. He gives us confidence. I mean, the way Dave's saying, you'd think he was a rock star. You know, just so confident, right? But that's the boldness that every single one of us have the right to possess in Christ. We can have confidence. We can have access to him by faith. Now, boldness, confidence, and faith are a little different than being pushy, arrogant, or deserving what we get, right? It's a whole different attitude. I saw this lady's tombstone this week. And she had, you just knew from seeing it that she didn't ask for it, that her kids just knew her so well. All they put was a picture of her face, her life and death dates, and a quote from her that said, politeness makes the world go round. And you know, they put that on her tombstone because she had probably said it a hundred times. They heard it day in and day out because she lived it. We also have power that is miracles. How many of you have ever heard of miracle stories? I, would, I heard a bunch of stories this week. Stories of healing and resurrection from the dead. And um, I don't know if you remember Bruce McVady. He was our interim pastor. He told me, I could, he asked me, he gave me permission to say this publicly. But you know, when I got here, he was dying of cancer. I don't know if it, the people in the church know that. They gave him a few years to live. He went up to Mayo Clinic and had the special treatment. And they said, Pastor McVady, we can give you maybe three years, maybe two with this new treatment. Pastor McVady, is, I saw him. He is a changed person. The color is in his face. The bounce is in his step. I've never seen him happier. He looks like he could pull a whole plow like a team of horses. It's because God completely eliminated the cancer from his body. I met a lady over at the Presbyterian Church. I've been praying for her friend. She had some tumors like our, our sister here was taken out and they were cancerous. And they went back in and took some more out and they examined them and they were completely cancer free. These miracles are possible. But I want to tell you a different kind of miracle. A power of a miracle. There's a guy named Donnie Register down in, I think in Louisiana or Mississippi. And he owned an antique store. And he was at the cash register. And his name's Donnie Register. He's at the cash register. And these two old boys come in with guns. And they're going to hold him up. So Mr. Register raises his hands to surrender, but they still shoot right at his head. And one of the, the bullet hit his wedding ring. I got the wrong finger there, don't I? Hit the wedding ring, and it bounced off the wedding ring, and he was okay. Now, he had been married 38 years, and he said, I do not chalk this up to luck. He believes that his marriage saved his life. He said, I knew being married was a good thing, but I didn't know it was going to be that good. Now, his wife says that God deserves all the credit for saving him and says that this also reminds men that they need to wear their wedding rings all the time. I thought that was cute. So we are chosen to be blessed, to be a blessing, but we are also chosen to be united, just like in Mr. and Mrs. Register's marriage. The Bible said over and over in this passage that it's all about God's grace. That's God's goodness. It's all about God's grace and his glory. God wants to get credit for this, but he also wants you and me to get credit. The Bible said today over and over, he wants this to be for our glory. Well, what is this? What is all this glory going to come from? You may be surprised that the miracle of Christian unity is seen in the church. That's what we heard in the Bible today. The fact is that God shows grace and mercy and forgives and accepts us and adopts us as children. And that is God's glory. It's evidence that his plan for the universe is right. I don't know if you caught this little verse in here, but it said that God was going to use the church, the fact that he forgives us and redeems us and loves us and adopts us as his own children, that he marries to us, that he makes us his own. 
that he uses the church as evidence to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Now, we don't talk about it much because we have a very simple view of how the world works. You know, we, get a, we grow up, we go to school, we get a job, we get married, we have kids, we retire, and then we die. We believe there's God, He's good, and Satan, He's bad, and there's a heaven, and there's an earth, and maybe there's a hell. And that's pretty much what we got. But when you read Scripture, apparently the people that wrote the Bible think that things are a lot more complicated. And in the heavenly places, there are rulers and authorities that apparently God has to make a courtroom-style case to. And His entire case is that love is better, forgiveness is better, that us being all united from here to eternity is better. Better than being the best, better than being the most powerful, better than being right all the time, better than being perfect. And as his evidence in this heavenly courtroom to the heavenly authorities and rulers, he presents you and me in the church. And he says, look at them as proof that my grace is going to bring glory, that my grace is the way to go. God's mercy may seem foolish to the powerful beings, but the Bible said today that it proves, quote, the manifest wisdom of God. Our unity in Christ, our unity with each other, our unity in the church, where we're called the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, it was, quote, the eternal purpose that He revealed in Jesus our Lord. Friends, we are God's big secret plan. <laughs> I know that may not sound like much, but I don't know if you ever watched the A-Team. When I was a kid, I watched the A-Team and Hannibal Lecter. You know, not Hannibal Lecter, that was the, the scary movie. Uh, Hannibal, he would always have that big cigar, and everything would go wrong. And at the end, they would save the day, and he would say, I love it when a plan comes together, right? That was George Papad. I used to watch him on the black and white movies back in the older days. So Paul prays this. He says, for this reason, I'm praying for you. Because everything rests on you, the church. And he wasn't talking to a big mega church. He was talking to a little bitty church of probably 20, 50 people that he started himself. He was talking to us. And he said, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, so that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you, you and me, us, strength and power through His Spirit in our inmost beings, so that Christ can dwell in our hearts by faith. United with Christ, united with the church, united with all creation. Without being chosen for this blessing, all the universe will de decay and die. There is not anything in creation that has its own battery. Even the brightest star and the most powerful galaxy will dwizzle, dwizzle, dwizzle down and stop without God. God chose in His wisdom to use our limitations and even our sinfulness and our divide, dividedness. You know, you, they say you're born alone, you live alone, you die alone. There's some truth to that. But God says that He wants to wrap us in His love so that we're never alone. You are never alone. God uses our limits to shower us with unmeasurable amounts of love to prove to us and to the heavenly beings and the powers that be through the church that this is the way to go. I got a cousin who just got his uh, master's in economics and went back down to um, Haiti. I might have mentioned Nathan, uh, my aunt Rhonda and Uncle Barry's son, Nathan. And he wrote me this weekend. You know, they had the, the gas riots that I mentioned last week. And so he's kind of holed up for safety reasons. And he had this new plan of way to help people. And so he was, he was talking to me about it. And he basically wanted to give an allowance to all the kids he works with. You know, give them a little spending money to buy some food when they're hungry. You know, shoes on their feet to buy a pencil for goodness sake. You know, he wants to give them a little, an endowment, a little, a little basis to operate under. There's a famous economist named Milton Friedman. I don't know if you've ever heard of Milton Friedman. He said the easiest and best way to give away money is to put a bunch of cash in a helicopter and push it out the door. The best way you can help people sometimes is just to shower them with love and, and let them figure out the best way to do it. There's actually a program like this in Kenya called Give Directly, if you're interested. They give a certain amount of income to five different villages, and they compare them with ten other villages without a basic free income. And they're going to see over the last, you know, they've already measured it for years. They're going to measure it for a decade more and see what it does. 
We are chosen to be blessed, to be a blessing. We are chosen to be united, unbelievably united. And we are chosen to be saved. God doesn't just want us on the bus to get us where we're going. He wants each and every one of us to be, quote, filled with the fullness of God. Now, now that I'm a mechanical man and I can I own and operate my own chainsaw, um, <laughs> I was like, how am I going to mix that fluid? That's, he says, we sell it pre-mixed. I like sold. Give me the biggest can you got. I'm putting that in the garage. <laughs> how much can you put in a five-gallon jug? Five gallons, right? Not according to the Holy Scripture today. According to God, He said He can put all of God into you and me. He can put the fullness of God in you and me. The infinite in the finite. We are chosen to be saved and filled as vessels of God. I know we get used to this every day. Just like we get to the, used to the beauty of Princeton or the beauty of the sky or of nature. And we kind of get used to it. But I want you to be overwhelmed at some point in this week when you think that God chose you as His vessel to fill up because He wants you to have the fullness of God. I'm going to tell you a story from 2 Samuel chapter 7 and 8. David had been blessed. He'd had some hard times. He'd had some rough times. But he was blessed. God had given him a great house, many wives, a lot of children. Some of you may argue that that's not a blessing. We're going to go with it's a blessing. Gave him a throne, and he gave him rest from all of David's enemies. No one was attacking him anymore. He'd lived for 30, 40 years of his life, always on the run, always pushed aside, always criticized, always attacked. Ne no matter how good he did, it was never enough. And then all of a sudden, he reached this plateau of rest where nobody was attacking him. And he was so thankful that he offered to build God a temple. But God said no. And God said, I chose to bless you. And in fact, I'm going to bless you even more. But you're not going to build my temple. And so after this promise from God, David began to pray how thankful he was. How am I worthy of these blessings? All these... He didn't say, look at all the good things I did and how hard I worked and I deserve this. He said, God, I don't deserve any of this. And yet you've taken care of me in the past. You've blessed me in the future and you've given me promises I couldn't even imagine for the tomorrow. I like to thank people after they bless me, especially after they've done work around the yard, they've cut down trees, they mowed the yard. I was like, thank you very much. Why? Because it saved me from work. We are blessed because God saves us from doing work. He says, no, you don't have to build the temple. You don't have to do this job. I'm going to do it for you. And we should just say thank you to God. But listen to this. I don't know if I should say this, but we were having a trustees meeting, and I said to them, you know, we got a couple little odd jobs, like such and such needs to be paid. It won't take but a minute. And they just all looked at me at the same time and said, well, you do it. <laughs> and so that made me realize, yeah, I really am thankful when, you know, Harry Hayes and Marsha and other people come out and they do these little jobs, because otherwise the trustees would just tell me to do everything. God saves us from a whole lot of you do it. But then in chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible says this about David. After he'd been blessed, after he'd offered, after God said, no, I'm going to bless you more, after David prayed, thank you, thank you, thank you, the Bible starts with these two words. And after this, David defeated and subdued the Palestinians, the, the Philistines. So David went beyond his borders, beyond his comfort zone, and he conquered and settled some things that were potential future problems. The two words I want you to take, and only two words... You are chosen to have an after this. Sometimes when I'm praying with someone, I'll get a, a, a or counseling someone, I'll get a picture. And I, I've just taken now, it's happened so many times, I just tell them, I said, God gives me a picture and here's the, the vision I have for you. It's just a simple picture. And it means something to them. But I was with a man who's, um, who's passing away, facing his death, and I felt God give me a sentence. And that rarely, rarely happens because I, I don't feel it's presumptuous. Who am I to say something at the end of someone's life? So after hemming and hawing and visiting, and I finally said, you know, I feel like God has given me this sentence to share with you. The rest of your life is going to be the best of your life. We think of the end of life as a scary time. 
But God promises today in Scripture that you have an after this. That the rest of our life can be the best. We can make the most of every moment. St. Augustine was hoeing his garden and someone came by and said, What if the end of the world were coming tomorrow? What would you do? And he said, I'd finish hoeing my garden today. Enjoy the moments we have. What I'm saying to you is what the trustees said to me. Stop whining and realize that we're winning. Change our focus. Focus. The, Paul said, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. There are going to be days where you don't feel enthusiastic. And if you don't feel like you have any reason to be excited for whatever's coming next, today is the day that you can change your focus to set your mind above and like Paul, join in the job we have to let people know that Jesus can do the same miracles in their life that he's done for you and me. Would you please rise and join in him singing hymn number 560, I Love to Tell the Story.